Besides the fact that we have Jane Ringeroff here today, we also have our own Buzz Beecham back with us. Uh, Buzz, good to see you back, and make sure you get back to him and say hey to him. He's been gone for an entire semester, and he's had uh, some good work to report to us, I hope, and things. How's the COVID situation? Pretty normal? Okay, great, awesome. And he's working at African Bible College, and so giving his life away for the cause of Christ. Uh, we're going to be back in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's uh, pray, and we'll look at our scripture passage from verse 10 to verse 15 today. Father God, we thank you so much for your word that gives us truth, it gives us hope, it gives us life, because it leads us to Jesus Christ. And God, I pray that today that your word will uh, stir in us just a newfound passion, God, or reignite, reignite that passion for your name, God, so that we can go out of here, each one of us being a missionary, to do your work in where you've called us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So just a reminder for those uh, who have maybe been in and out during the series or for those that it's your first time here today, Paul is imprisoned in Rome and he knows his life's about to be over. He writes about that. He senses that he's going to be executed very soon. And so these are the kind of last words, so to speak, and they carry a sense of urgency that can be felt as if someone was dying and they're boiling down, like here's the most important things I want you to hear. Paul's boiling down the truth to the essentials that are necessary. And what's awesome is to know that Paul's mind here isn't on himself. He's sitting in a Roman prison. It's not a nice situation at all. His mind's not on himself. It's not on the injustice that's been done to him, but it's on his ministry, and particularly it's on Timothy and the fact that he wants his protege, Timothy, to trust God more and to stand strong for God and not, be, not cave in to the pressures that are around him. So we're going to go back and reread verses 10 through 13 from last week just to kind of get the context again. So he says to Timothy, he says, you, however. So Timothy, picture Timothy here. He's reading this, and this is very personal. Even though Timothy knows these words are to be read to the church, it has a, an extremely personal element to Timothy himself. So he's singling him out. If you've ever been singled out in a crowd and you know how that feels, Timothy's being singled out. This is urgent. It's real. It's true. You need to listen. And he says, Timothy, you follow my teaching. You follow my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, again, he singles Timothy out. And so Paul is contrasting Timothy here in Timothy's life to these false teachers and these people who have come into the church to begin to teach these things that are not true to the gospel. And so he's telling Timothy, he says, I know you're not going to abandon the faith. You're not going to abandon your post there at Ephesus as a pastor. Yes, there will absolutely be persecution. And yes, people are evil, and it's only going to get worse, Timothy. It's going to get bad, go bad from bad to worse. Many people are going to be deceived, and there are going to be imposter, imposters in the church who are going to work to deceive other people. But for you, Timothy, for you, don't let it phase you. So it's personal. Timothy, you followed me, Paul says. You trusted me. And now I'm asking you to do some things, and I myself have already done them, and in fact, I'm suffering for doing them right now. But Timothy, stay the course. Don't stop. Don't quit. And from our study of 1 Timothy, we've seen that Timothy appears, from all indications, that he struggled with anxiety. You remember Paul said, have a little wine for your stomach's sake, stake back in in 1 Timothy, and so he was probably struggling with anxiety, all this pressure on a young guy. He was a little bit timid. He was a little bit reluctant. He probably didn't have a personality like Paul's. And then on top of that, he was then besieged by these false teachers who were coming in to his church, and he was being threatened by persecution. So the letter to Timothy, the word to Timothy, Timothy, stay the course, stay faithful, don't quit, make a difference for Jesus. And I've seen many people in the course of my lifetime who have 
been excited for Jesus in the moment, only to move on to false teaching, to false truth, and believing other things. And false teaching and false truth, believe it or not, is all around us. And you may think, well, here in Bainbridge, Georgia, there's false teachers and there's false truth all around us. And you're beginning to rack your mind like, okay, what church is he talking about here? Who are the people that he's talking to about false teachers? Well, the people aren't necessarily sitting in a church building, and they're not necessarily at a desk or behind a pulpit today preaching a false gospel, although there may be some. But what we're talking about here is this anti-God worldview that permeates our society and it's being simulated, it's being given out in doses, huge doses throughout our culture through things like something you have access, access to the entire world at any time you want, your phone, through the internet, through media, through TV. There's an anti-God worldview that's being pushed constantly. Now, let's back up for a second. You may be thinking, what's a worldview? What, what does that mean by that? Let me explain to you just real practically what a worldview is if you don't really understand that concept. All of us come at something with a point of view. I have an apple here. A botanist would look at this and he would say, I need to classify that apple. An artist might walk by and from his perspective, he would see a potential painting. How am I going to frame that up in a painting? A kid may walk by and say, man, it looks like lunch to me and begin to eat it. A teenager may grab this and say, man, this makes a good baseball. I'm going to whip that across the room and see what happens when it hits the wall. A grocer looks at it, and he begins to inventory it and put it in stock. And so everybody comes at this from their own, it, what's, they, they, they look at situations, and they're influenced by how they look at the world in general. And so that's what we're talking about when we talk about a worldview. And so today, many of us, as Miss Jane was talking here about Buddhism, Buddhism, and we think about Hinduism and Islam, we think about these world religions, and we can identify very quickly false teaching and false worldviews on these type of things because they don't believe in the God of the Bible. They don't believe in the Judeo-Christian ethic. But other worldviews are much more subtle, and they populate and they pollute our minds oftentimes without us even realizing it. Talking about things like secularism which is not a word that we hear thrown around a lot, but basically it's a belief that matter is all there is and that God isn't either, he's either not relevant or he doesn't exist at all. There's things like Marxism that believes the system is terrible. It has to be overthrown because it exploits the poor and it only benefits the rich, and so let's throw that out. There's things like postmodernism that says, don't try to tell, tell me you have truth. Don't try to say you have truth. And they're suspicious of any truth claims because nobody has access to the truth. There's new spirituality. There's new age, like karma. What comes around goes around. And you're going to get what you give and evil and good. And there's a spirituality that exists, but it's not based upon the Bible. And then there's what Jeff Myers calls a multiple worldview disorder. Basically, this is where many people in today's society find themselves. They just pick and choose based on what they want. It doesn't matter if this idea and this idea conflict with one another. And it doesn't really matter that I believe this today because tomorrow I may just believe something totally different. And so it's this hodgepodge of worldview beliefs that we just gather from whatever resource we pull from at the moment and whatever feels right at the moment. And get this, hear this. Parents particularly hear this. 75% of all Christian young people fall away from their faith and leave the church after high school. 75% leave the church and fall away from faith after high school. And then here's one more statistic for you. Barna research shows that only about one half of 1%, so one per, say, think 1%, think about half of 1% of people between the ages of 18 and 23 have a true biblical worldview. Only one half of 1% have an accurate and true worldview, according to Barna. Deception is everywhere. Liars are everywhere. And here's the thing. It's easy to look at this and say it's either black or white. It's like, I don't believe, or I believe, 
but yet we fail to see that there's all these shades in the middle that probably we fall into. Somebody in here may not say God doesn't exist at all. I mean, there might be few people who would actually say that. And I'm just going to live for whatever I can do, get in this world. I'm going to live for my toys. I'm going to live for all the stuff I can acquire. I'm just going to bathe in materialism and get as much as I can because God doesn't exist and I don't have to give account for what I do after this life. Nobody would probably be on the scale to that extreme possibly in here. But you may fall on that secularism scale somewhere. Like, for instance, that God's real and exists. I'm here today, aren't I? But God pretty much gets my leftovers. All right? So after all the stuff that I do and all what I give to all the other things I want to give and buy and purchase, then I can give to God my leftovers. You see, that's a form of secularism because it says, I'm not believing the God of the Bible. My worldview is maybe in word it says that God deserves everything. But in actions, it says that God gets my leftovers. Or there's a true biblical worldview that says it's all God's anyway. It's all his. And my giving back to him, what already belongs to him, reveals my priorities. So how I spend my money, how I spend my time, how I spend my energies, that shows really what I believe about God. And so it's not an all or nothing. Think of of another way, you know. Some people might say, I have no need for God in here. I don't really, I'm here because I got drug here. I don't really have a need for God. There's other people who say, I I attend church when it's convenient. Or you might not say that, but the way that your life stacks up and the way that it falls, that you work in church attendance when it's convenient to your schedule, when there's no better option, when, you know, there's not a lot else going on. So that says something about your worldview. Versus other people who would say, as Jane talked about, Man, I need this community. I need these people. This woman's crying going to church because she can't wait to be with God's people. She can't wait to be around other believers. Why? Because she needs them desperately. Her life and the direction of her life left to herself would be discouraging. And God's there, but the body of Christ, the hands and feet of Christ, she needs to sustain her and help her through another week. And so you can talk a good talk about secularism. I don't believe in that. But your life can show something completely different. So the false teachers of Timothy's day might look different than the false teachers of today, but nevertheless, they exist. And and Paul says to Timothy, don't let the pressures of this world phase you. Don't let the pressures of this world make you conform into their image. But look what he says to Timothy in verse 14. He says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it. Like many of you, I grew up in church. And in fact, it was expected of me once I graduated from high school that I would go off to a Christian college. Kind of, you know, my course was charted for me on that. But I began to wonder, particularly as I got to a senior in high school and even off into college at a Christian college, I began to think, you know, my parents, honestly, you know, no offense, but they're not the smartest people around. They're pretty basic, plain people from West Virginia. And so all this stuff they've been telling me about the Bible and God's Word, is, is that true? Or is that just like a simple man's approach to learning about the universe and learning about life? And so I begin to have doubts and questions, and I begin to struggle. Is this something that I've just accepted or received, or is it something that I really truly believe? Look, everyone who is intellectually engaged at some point is going to have some issues with doubt. Anybody who seriously thinks, you may struggle with doubts at some point in your, in your life. And so we need to remember a couple of things here, that faith... Our Christianity, our our faith in God is rooted in faith. That God has never promised us tangible truth, proof of himself. He's not going to physically appear to you, tap you on the shoulder and say, here I am, believe in me. And so for many times, we, our level of proof, our burden of proof is that high, right? I'll believe it when I see it. 
I'll believe it when I interact with it. I'll believe it when it's right there in front of me. Now look, just because God doesn't give you tangible evidence of himself in front of you, doesn't mean there's not sound intellectual reasons to believe and put your faith in Jesus and God and his word. But you're not going to be transported back to the time of Christ when you become a Christian and then you get to observe the resurrection yourself. You're not going to see it happening like, okay, now I get it. Or God's not going to teleport you back to creation as he's speaking and the universe is coming into existence. He's going to, not going to set you down and let you observe that so you'll believe. That's not the way that it works. Scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God puts a huge premium on hearing. In fact, Jesus told his disciples, Thomas, you need to stick your hand on my side to believe. Blessed are those who come behind who believe without seeing. That's us, right? But here's the thing also to remember when it comes to having doubts and begin to think about your faith, that it's never purely just an intellectual issue. William Lane Craig, an apologist, brilliant man, Christian, writes this. He says, recognize that doubt is never purely intellectual, a purely intellectual problem. There is a spiritual dimension to the problem that must be recognized. Never lose sight of the fact that you are involved in a spiritual warfare and that there is an enemy of your soul who hates you intensely, whose goal is your destruction, and who will stop at nothing to destroy you. When you have doubts, when you have struggles, it's important that you do something with those. Go and speak to somebody who you view as a mentor, a spiritual mentor, somebody you look up to. Talk to someone. Get in a fight club and begin to have those conversations. Admit it. You know, I struggle with doubt sometimes. You won't be alone. In fact, two-thirds of Christians struggle with doubts at times. Doubts are a normal part of life. Do something with them. And so Paul says to Timothy, he says, look, Timothy, think about truth for a second. You've been given this truth. In verse 14, you've learned it, you've believed it, and you've been taught by this truth by people who have authenticated it by their life. You've been taught it by people who have said, hey, here's what you need to believe, and my life is backing that up. And then he says, I think is implied here in this, in this text, and it's important for us to realize, just like there's an adversary that truly exists who's warring against you, trying to derail your faith and make you fall off for God and, and, and abandon your faith and just give up and give in to this world, and it says, get what you can when you can, There's an enemy, but there's also God who's been pursuing Timothy since he was a little child. He's been taught these things from since he was a little, little baby. And we're going to talk more about that next week. But he says that your faith, your pursuit, God's pursuing you, this isn't an accident. This isn't an accident. Have you ever, think about your life for a second, have you ever experienced something that just, there was overwhelming odds for it to happen, but it happened anyway? Think about a a time in your life where just something was just so freak and just such a a, a thing of chance, but it happened. I think of a time we went to Texas Stadium with our youth ministry to hear Billy Graham. This was back in the early 2000s. And one of the students in our youth ministry, his name was Luke Hatterberg, and Luke was legally blind. The only way that he could read or see was if something was very, very close to him. He could not see much at all. So As we were in there with 70,000 people in the stadium, we're like, Luke, this is before everybody had cell phones. We said, Luke, stay close, okay? Stay close to us, all right? Hold on to someone. Don't get lost. Well, here we are. We're headed out after it's over to the van, and we're looking around. I'm doing a head count again just to make sure we have everybody looking around. Leaders, do you have your people? And Luke's nowhere to be found. Luke's nowhere to be found. All we can see is a sea of people. I hop up on a railing. I'm looking. I'm like, Luke, where are you at, man? No, Luke. I'm like, God, help me, please. We can't lose this kid in this crowd, all right? I I just can't go home and tell his parents we lost your son, all right? And so I just start walking back, and I'm praying, God, please, please let me find Luke. And boom, right there he is. Luke's there. I mean, the odds are so slim. 70,000 people 
just astronomical odds. Why don't you think about these odds for a second, okay? The fact that you even exist scientifically, the odds are one in, let me look at the number here. The number is one in four quadrillion, all right? I have no idea how big that is, but it's a monster number. One in four quadrillion that you, the egg and everything met up, right? Not to go into too much detail here with kids in the room, but you were fertilized and you became a human being. The odds of that are incredible, astounding. And then there's 7.9 billion people in this world, and of, of those, two-thirds of those either have never heard the name of Jesus or don't know Jesus as Savior. And so you're in a pretty elite group of people, the fact that you believe Jesus or you know about Jesus. And then the fact that you are sitting here in the seat today, hearing God's word being taught. The odds of your existence, you being a Christian, possibly raised in a Christian home, and being here under the word today, astronomical odds. So here's the truth of the matter is. It may feel like that you had a lot to do with the fact that you're contemplating Jesus or you're considering giving more of your life to Jesus or you're considering giving your life to Jesus at all. But just like with Timothy, God has been inviting you to him. He has been any, any not acknowledgement of him and his truth of, of who he is and his person and his character and the fact that he truly is real and he's a person, all of that is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. It's his grace that has been given to you. And you may think that it's like a lot you're doing, but if you step back and see it from God's perspective, it's his doing. He, Jesus said this. He said, no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Nobody comes unless I draw you. Don't think that you're smart enough and you're better than these five billion other people on the planet that the fact that you've gotten to this point where you're considering Jesus or you're putting your faith in Jesus or you have put your faith in Jesus. We feel like it's under our control, that it's our decision, our will. We're wired that way to feel that way. But here's an illustration that may help you understand why you feel that way. Back when I was in high school, I told this story before, we used to go to the juvenile detention center to, in Tallahassee to share our faith and talk to these guys. Well, we would go in there and we'd share for an hour, and then we'd leave. They'd buzz us out the door. We'd go out a series of locks and out, out, out the front door. Well, one night, we were headed out the door, and we got into this, like, little area where, like, there was a basketball court and some other area locked in still. And they said, I'm sorry, there's been a security breach, a problem. You guys need to wait right here until we figure this out. Well, while I stood there in this courtyard, I, one, I didn't feel threatened at all by what was going on. Also, you know, I struck up a conversation with the guard. We began to talk and have a conversation and get to know him a little bit. Hey, where are you from? What are you doing? What, how'd you get here? It was cool, you know, just meeting him and so on. I was, the other guys I came with, we were talking, have a conversation. I felt like I was pretty free at that moment, you know? I could build relationships. I could lean over on the, on the table and talk. I felt a, a sense of freedom. But you know what? Until the guard buzzed those doors and opened those things up so I could exit, I wasn't free at all. I felt free, but I wasn't free. And here's the thing that Paul's telling Timothy. God has been pursuing you since you were a little guy. God has graced you with knowledge of him, his word, teaching. All of these gifts of grace that are his doing and not your own. And so the, the, the point is that God, when he speaks to us, we better pay attention. Because everybody doesn't have that benefit. Everybody is not graced with that. And so in, in D-Now Weekend, all right, as you're sitting here and you've had an incredible weekend of hearing TJ preach and the band play, and you're like moved and you're like, oh man, you know, I, I need to do something for God or I need to respond to God. And you have these great feelings and you're singing these songs and your heart's beating and you're, you're excited and it's, there's a lot of energy. Then you go home today. And then you go back to your life. And it's a lot like what Jane does. She stands up here and tells us these stories and shows us pictures. It's like, well, that's pretty cool. But most of the time, I'm sure, as a single lady living in a foreign country, she's pretty lonely. Yet God gives her this joy, this incredible joy about her life and her mission. 
And here's the thing we forget so often times is if we truly believe, you remember the secularism scale, the thing we saw, that if you really believe that God exists, then this life is just a little teeny fraction of eternity. I mean, so little that it would be insignificant in the big picture of things. Eternity lasts forever and forever and forever and forever. And so it seems like a good trade-off to me, as Jesus said, lose your life to gain your life. To count your life but loss. Is that not good motivation for Jane to go to Japan? And is that not good motivation when you wake up in the morning and you think, well, I miss D now. I miss my friends around. You know, I love the feeling I had there. To say, you know what, God? I'm going to believe that the truth is that you exist. And as Hebrews says, you reward those who diligently and earnestly seek after me. And so I'm going to believe God. I'm going to take him for his word. Because that's what Timothy did. Look at verse 15. He says, And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, these would be in the Old Testament, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So again, it's the same thing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So Timothy, you've heard these sacred writings. You've heard the Old Testament taught you. Now as you've been given the gospel, you, you see the fuller sense of what the Old Testament's all about. The Old Testament has just been a big finger pointing to Jesus Christ. That's what the Old Testament is. It's, it says Jesus is everything, and he's coming. He's the Messiah. All these sacrifices and offerings that you've been doing, they all point to Jesus Christ. And so the point is Jesus. And the point of the written word, both Old and New Testament, is leading people to a saving knowledge of God through Jesus Christ. That's the point. And so that's why when we read the Bible, we don't read for information. We don't read just to check it off our list. I feel better. That's what the youth pastor said to do or TJ said to do. I read the Bible because it points me to Jesus, and I want to know Jesus and have a relationship with Jesus. And that seems really, really hard for some people. You're sitting here and like, I don't understand how words on a page can make me know Jesus and have a relationship with Jesus. Well, it defies logic. It seems impossible. But that's where faith comes in. Faith is taking God at his word. That he says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of truth, the word of Jesus, the word of life. And so you believe. Faith acts and says, I don't feel, but I'm acting. I don't have warm, fuzzy feelings, but I'm doing what God told me to do. And this points to Jesus Christ. And saving faith and trust in Christ is a living person. It's not just a bunch of facts we believe. It's not just something that we just like give mental assent to. I believe all these things. But do you know Jesus? In closing, missionary John Patton, he went to a place in the South Sea, and there he encountered people who obviously didn't know the language that the Bible was translated into. So as many missionaries back in the day, he had to translate the Bible into their language. Well, he was having a very difficult time of finding a word, a concept for believing, trusting, and having faith. He just couldn't come up with the right word that really showed that, that the nature of faith and what it was really about. And so one day he was in his hut, and he was in there translating Scripture, and in comes one of the natives, and he comes running in. He flops himself down on a chair, exhausted. He looks at Patton. He says to Patton, it's so good to rest my whole weight in this chair. It's so good to rest my entire weight here in this chair. And Pat says, what's that word you just used about resting your weight? Oh, here's the word. That's it. That's the word I need for faith. Faith is resting my entire weight on Jesus. And as Scripture says, I don't lean to my own understanding. I don't count my intellect and my knowledge to be superior to God. I trust him. And I rest my weight there. doesn't mean that doubts won't come at times. They will. Because we're wired to be people who want to see and touch and feel and interact. The doubts will come. But we rest our weight in Jesus and we tell Jesus, 
Jesus, I have my doubts, but I'm trusting you. I'm depending. I'm putting my weight fully upon you, even as I work through these things. Putting my weight on Jesus. Well, we talk every week. We give application. Our head, our heart, and our hands, because it's all of it together. It's not just intellectual. It's not just warm, fuzzy feelings, and it's not just doing the stuff. It's all working together to make you more like Jesus. So here's the head. Jesus is real. He's not a feeling. Jesus is real. He's not a feeling. And so we don't allow our feelings to interpret interpret the circumstances or form our thoughts about Jesus. We go to his word, and we learn what the word says about Jesus. And we don't pursue our feelings. We pursue a person. We pursue Jesus. And in that, we live victoriously. And then in our heart, saturate yourself with the Word of God. Faith comes from hearing the Word of God. 1 John 5, 4, For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. So if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, then we need to increase our faith. And the way we increase our faith is the Word of God. And faith is what gives us the victory in this life. And so the hands, the hands is going to be literal today, really literal today, all right? Uh, and, and teenagers, you may get a, a little jump start on anybody else, but if you t- I want you to text me and say, I'm committing to 21 days of being in the Word, straight being in the Word. And, and I'm not talking about people, don't text me if you're in the Word consistently. But if you're sitting here today and you're like, you're struggling and you need commitment and you need help to like keep that commitment and you've not done a good job but you want to do that, text my number. And here's the first person who texts me and says, I'm in on this 21 days. I got a disciple's Bible that I'm going to give you afterwards, all right? So text me your name. I mean, I have your contact and say, hey, I'm Joe and, and, you know, Smith. Here, here's my contact, and I'll find you afterwards, and we'll get you this Bible, okay? So 21 days of committing to Scripture. 21 days to say, I'm going to be in God's Word. I'm going to pray and say, God, open my mind and open my heart and open my hands to a person Jesus Christ. Not a feeling, not just more information, but to the person of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the gift of your word, and we thank you for just allowing us to just stand here and be here and hear your word being preached, and to be able to take it and just give it and receive it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ that they will truly see the value of the sacred writings, as Paul called it to Timothy, that can make us wise to salvation in Jesus Christ. And Father God, I pray that you'll help us to be a church that is consistently and meaningfully in your word so we can know you. And God, I pray for those in here, especially our students who, it's so easy to want just the feelings and the emotions, and we love feelings and emotions. You wired us and created us that way. But we know the reality is that that can't be where we live our lives. And God, I pray you'll just give them encouragement. Bring along good leaders and teachers and mentors who can help them and guide them as they go through this life and struggle with doubt and questions as their faith is being pushed in universities and colleges. God, I pray that you will help them to trust you and remember their teaching, remember their training, and not think that they can ever outgrow that because you've gifted them with something that's so valuable and so unique in this world and so true, which is yourself. In Jesus' name.